Thank you, and thank you for an excellent organization by the team of Skagen. Uh, I really enjoy being here. And talking to you on this topic, which might seem a little bit strange given the audience. Does anyone recall uh, the slogan, American by birth, rebel by choice? It's a slogan from the Harley-Davidson Motor Company. And a few decades ago, they were fighting a losing battle against foreign competition and poor quality in its main product. Their main owner, American Machine and Foundry, AMF, they wanted out. They no longer wanted to own one of the most legendary brands of America Incorporated. When they had invested in HD in 1969, the company had a reputation for good quality, entrepreneurial pride, innovation, ingenuity, and so on. By the time AMF wanted out, that reputation was all but squandered. A management buyout saved the day. A group of managers bet everything they had on themselves and the motorcycle company, and the legend could roll on. Capitalist stewardship saved the day. Now, the AMF had not been a bad owner, per se. They invested a lot of money in the company. But for them, HD was just one of many investments. Owning many companies allowed them to diversify their portfolio, just like a professional investor do. Yet for, for Harley Davidson, to share space with bowling equipment, atomic research reactors, snowmobile, golf carts, tennis rackets, and so on, that was just a very awkward situation. It was like forcing the Swedish footballer Slatan Ibrahimovic out of the pitch and to play bridge with, let's say, Axel Lund Svindal. It's just a very awkward situation. With its identity and customers, HD could not thrive nor benefit from any synergies. HD needed owners that allowed them to be a rebel by choice or that let Slatan play ball. They needed a capitalist owner that allowed them to be entrepreneurial, one that was not investing on finance theory formula. So why am I telling you this story? One of the greatest benefits of free market capitalism is its ability to make room for and make use of new innovations. This, the capitalist innovation machine, has been the envy of many thinkers throughout history, from the left to the right on the political scale, from Karl Marx to Josef Schumpeter. And Schumpeter once concluded that capitalist innovation machine creates a perennial gale of creative destruction. A perennial gale of creative destruction. It, it is a force that constantly pushes everyone from governments to companies to individuals to better themselves. So if anything, this perennial gale of creative destruction is, in a positive term, betterments. And there's no other economic system in the world, of course, that comes even close of doing the same thing. No other system that creates more economic value because of this ability. Billions of people have been lifted from poverty around the world because of this. And for the sake of open democratic societies and our future, we better hope that we can regain this and continue to create economic value and continue to improve people's lives with this ability. We heard a calling for return to long, strong and, and per permanent growth, I think it was mentioned from, from the professor. I, I adhere to that. Yes, absolutely. Capitalism is now a system that people say has not been working for me like it used to. So we need to find something here that, is not, that has been, it's not in the right way. But here's the problem. Capitalism is the system of ownership, and it simply cannot survive or may be maintained without the character, the capitalist. Like it or not, but capitalism is a system of ownership that is built around the entrepreneurial capitalist. We tend to forget this. But then think where we are today after 40 to 50 years of shrinking the role of the capitalist in ownership of public, fir public firms in Western economies. And, and mind you, I'm just talking about Western economies. I'm not talking about, about other parts of the world, which is, of course, equally important. But this is the great experiment of Western capitalism, a capitalist that is running out of capitalists. 
Now, I would tell you that this makes capitalism lose its mojo. And when people say that we're living in the most innovative of times, I hardly see that to be the case because of, because of this experiment, and I will try to explain why this is. And very importantly, I'm not talking about current events. I'm going to talk about the long trajectory. I'm going back to the 1950s, and I'm trying to tell you a story about a capitalist that is changing not that much every year, perhaps, but in the long run, something is happening. So what is this great experiment? When, when I said that capitalist owners are a rare species today, what do I mean? Well, I'm not talking about the jet-setting members of the billionaire club flying around trying to escape boredom. And I'm not talking about Piketty's, Thomas Piketty's villains in his famous book, Capital, the one percenters, the rentiers. To be a capitalist or not has really nothing to do with wealth, although capitalists do, of course, have money too. But more importantly, they practice visible ownership. They are entrepreneurial. And they perform the critical role of controlling corporate development. But instead of capitalists, there has been a rapid growth of other forms of ownership in capitalism. And the change that we see in our economic system can be summarized in three ways. This is the great experiment of capitalism. The first is that we see a shift from capitalist owning firms to institutions. Now, a few decades ago, institutions and intermediaries were all but unknown in capitalism. And they have, just in a few decades, seized capitalism faster than the Holy Inquisition once conquered Spain. We have gone from approximately just a few percent, six percent of ownership of total outstanding equity that was institutionalized in the 1950s to almost 60% today throughout the Western world. Total assets under management by investment funds, insurance companies, and pension funds is equal to the size, equal to the size of the United States GDP times six. The proportion of invested capital coming from direct ownership doesn't really make any, doesn't even play an important role anymore. When individuals save for retirement, they use intermediaries. When governments save for citizens, they use professional investors, and so on and so on. Some saw what was coming very early on, and one of them, one of them was, of course, management guru Peter Drucker. He stirred up some angry feelings by pointing out the obvious in the 1970s, saying that if socialism is defined as ownership of the means of production by workers, then the United States is the first truly socialist country. Perhaps that was taking it a little bit far back in the 1970s, but what about today? Ownership of firms is changing, and it's changing very fast. Private inst investment institutions like Vanguard and BlackRock is growing really fast. BlackRock with the size of one Swedish telecom giant, LM Ericsson, every 12th day. And to perhaps swear a little bit in the church, let's talk about another dramatic example, that of sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds, SWF, they became high fashion of governments swimming in money for the sale of commodities, like crude oil, not until the turn of the millennium. Now, they were, of course, instigated, a few of them before the turn of the millennium, but most of the big SWFs were instigated in the notice. The name itself was coined as late as 2005. Growth has been really stable, and I think in total in, in the world, they're closing in on 10 trillion US dollars in size. Now, <clears throat> being a little bit provocative perhaps, especially in this room, you could argue that the influence from sovereign wealth funds today is so large that they constitute the greatest socialization of corporate assets in the West since the post-Second World Socialization of Central and Eastern Europe. Actually, the math makes up, trust me. And being perhaps even more provocative, you can say that they are all about politics. And to be very frank, and please don't kick me out, but does it make much of a difference if the fund sits in Oslo, Riyadh, or Beijing? It's still politics in the end. 
all about very different politics, I, I agree to that, but still politics. And mind you, we're talking about capitalists or not capitalists here. And it's very hard to imagine that we can call sovereign wealth funds capitalists or having capitalist characters or driving an entrepreneurial agenda. They are, for instance, riddled with governance issues and agency problems. And for instance, it's the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, which owns ultimate decision over China's sovereign wealth fund. And we can safely say that they are run on a political agenda. Think of your own sovereign wealth fund. Governing over one trillion US dollars in 72 countries in 9,000 companies. Can entrepreneurial capitalism be maintained in such a system? Maybe you can answer me that. The second aspect of the experiment of capitalism is the shift of focus from industry to finance. The tail is wagging the dog. Now, the financial sector just happened to, to get off to a fast-track development in the, in the earnest from the 1980s, just at about the time that, if you remember the villain in the movie Wall Street, Gordon Gekko came to symbolize financial capitalism. And in a few decades, the power dynamics in the economy have changed from the real industry, real economy, to finance. Today, the ratio between total global output of goods and services and financial assets is approximately 1 to 10. So for every real economy dollar, there's one financial dollar sitting on top of it. I would rather see finance less proud and industry more content argued Winston Churchill in 1925. He was not heard. The daily transaction of foreign exchange exceed trade in goods and services in England today by almost 100 times. Only 3% of lending from banks goes to firms that produce goods and services. The economy is not any anymore about the real economy. It's about the financial economy. Capitalism has transformed to what the late US economist Hein Minsky called money manager capitalism. Money managers making ultimate decisions over companies. The financial whiz kids are the masters of the universe. And they are often asset managers that administer investment funds, insurance companies, and pension funds. They are the masters rather than the servants of the real economy. So the tail is wagging the dog. The third aspect we've discussed a little bit today concerns pensions. Now, Westerners used to invest in companies, but today we save for pensions. And we don't have to go back that far to see how strange the system really is today. We have to go back to when German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck introduced the modern pension. It was, at the time, not much of a financial gamble. Life expectancy at birth in Germany was around 40 years, and retirement could be, under very specific circumstances, granted by the age of 70. Still, he was labeled a socialist, someone who put fiscal prudence in jeopardy. Today, life expectancy in Germany is approximately 81 years and rising, for good, and that's very good, of course, but with an effective retirement age of 61 to 62, and big cohorts of people coming into that age group, this is an increasing problem. The cost for pension care is galloping. And under the condition that the tax burden is not going to increase in Germany, we don't see much growth that's going to compensate, Germany needs to free up close to one-sixth of its current government expenditures because of pensions. Now, it looks even worse for the total euro area. And retirement and pension issues is going to increase in importance in the future for good reason. It's very good that we live longer. Of course it is. Someone said it out, and it's very important to say. But more money in retirement and pensions, it means, in my story, in my narrative of capitalism, that grey capital is increasing. And that's not a good thing. Because where does it lead us? Well, let's go to one of the old drama, dramas of life. Drama is, is life with the dull bits cut out, said Alfred Hitchcock. And capitalism used to be life with very few dull bits. 
It was, capitalism used to be part of something that Deirdre McCluskey in the Bourgeois area said, it's, an, in, in the, it's, it's the age of enlightenment. A space where people were suddenly allowed to experiment and play around and, and come up with new things. And mind you, this was something very, very new. Entrepreneurial people that dare to be different and that championed eccentric ideas could be rewarded instead of punished. But that was then, and now it's actually a little bit different. And I would argue that this great experiment is actually making capitalism gray. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's still room for entrepreneurial eccentricity, but actually less so than we would hope for, and much less so than I would hope for after seeing this great presentation before about nanotechnology. Capitalism has become gray for three reasons. It's complex by design, it allocates resources to a rentier formula, and it crowds out innovations. And I'm going to go through them one by one. Now, why is it complex by design, the economic system that we have? Well, if you look from afar, we seem to have an economic system that is working quite well. Rules and guidelines are separating, roles and responsibilities, and it appears to be a very considerate governance structure. But the closer you get, the more it looks like a very complex patchwork of conflicting interests and, and complicated rules. And to simplify all of this, you could say that ownership has become separated from ownership. Layers after layers of intermediaries stand between the ultimate money source and the subject of an investment. And this creates something, it's this well-known problem in capitalism, that it's an agency problem. And you could argue that capitalism got, has gotten trapped in something that you could call a principal agent foxhole. This is a rather tricky problem. And it raises a key question, who are the money managers and institutions working for? Themselves or the shareholders? Now, Again, several thinkers have discussed this problem throughout, from Adam Smith to the OECD. The OECD once said that the link of ownership is broken by an increasing complex universe of intermediaries whose business is to manage other people's money. So what does it mean? Well, it's when we think of how owners and companies deal with this problem that we start to realize why it makes capitalists gray. Corporate governance transformed into excessive planning. And it's drowning companies in red tape. And everything is, is supposed to control what corporate managers decide and boards do. We're, we're having a situation here, and I think many recognize this, that this leads to corporate governance by ticking boxes. Often with the oversight of lawyers, very skilled in legal matters, but very far from being entrepreneurial. In fact, we're paying lawyers not to be entrepreneurial. Managers of other people's money and compliance officers on different levels is cutting the link between ownership on the one hand and entrepreneurship on the other. Now, that is the control room that makes up most of what makes capitalism work. Destroy it, and we lose a key feature of capitalism. Capitalism turns gray. Now, the second reason is that capitalism, within capitalism, we allocate resources to Rensier formula. And to simplify it, it's almost like if gray capital owners no longer want companies to be companies, but rather saving platforms. It's like when we invest in pensions today or save for pension, it's like we want our companies to be banks, that is predictable and, and straightforward and with no risk or nothing will happen in the future. And part of that harks back to 1952, when Harry Markovic introduced, introduced what is today called the modern portfolio theory. And this theory is all about diversification, and I know many in the room works with it every day. And it's, it's become, for good reasons, the weapon of choice if you're investing in companies today. Diversification is an excellent idea. It decreases volatility and allocates resources in safer ways. Stanford professor Fleider said that 
What is the alternative? And that is the point. There are no real alternative for professional investors to use today. And they, use, and they all end up using the same divestment code. Now, the paradox is that it also brings a few very tricky problems, if you look at this from an innovation standpoint in, at capitalism. For one, no one really knows who owns and controls a company, let alone who the diffused owners are or what they want. And when no one knows who really owns a company, capitalism becomes faceless. It also weakens the investor's voice in each invested company. Companies with highly diluted ownership tend to have less engaged owners than the opposite. And it also makes investors have... You can say, they're not really thinking of competition like we think that capitalists work when it comes to competition. Killing competition becomes a no-no. Investors become more interested in keeping status quo, stability, before a perennial gale of creative destruction because they're owning in separate companies and many of them are competing with each other. Now, what happened with capitalism? Can capitalism actually exist without competition? I would argue no. Another consequence is that it turns high volatility in the portfolio into a sign of poor investment management. And that makes companies conservative and they stay away from the unknown like new innovations. So what about the third reason, crowding out innovations? There's much to say here, but I'm going to suffice with saying that only think of talent. It's been excessively attracted to the financial industry from the real economy, all, all the way from the 1980s and upwards. If you choose a career in the financial industry instead of the real industry, you made a lot of more money. Or consider how we think about financialization and how it effectively blurs the difference between financial skills and entrepreneurial skills. I mean, no one would argue that financial skills and qualities make financiers good carpenters or long-distance runners. But all seem to assume that financiers are good business developers. But is that really the case? I think that if you have a financial hammer, the whole world looks like a financial nail. But it's not entrepreneurial skills something else than financial skills. Innovation gets crowded out as business development is out. The emphasis on earnings per share argues Harvard's Clay Christensen diverts resources away from investments whose payoff lies beyond the immediate horizon. There's a clear negative relationship between finance sector and real growth, argues two economists at the Bank of International Settlements. Perhaps, perhaps not. But business creation, as it was intended, is becoming a nice add-on or an associated ambition, but not really what makes capitalism tick. So, all taken together, complexity, rent allocation, and crowding out of innovation, this ownership experiment seems to be a force that is rather closing McCloskey's space for entrepreneurial eccentricity. Capitalism becomes gray. And taking it a little bit further, you, you could also argue that capitalism is actually losing its mojo. Why? Well, let's go back to where I started, to one of the greatest benefits of free market capitalism. Its ability to make room for and make use of new innovations. Just to it's very, very important to understand what this means, because it's far more complicated task than to make up new things, which you know is really complicated in itself. Many today get technology innovation wrong because they have a machine-like idea of how innovations and the economy works. They think of innovation and economy like a planned economy, or a machine where economic renewal happens just because you happen to have a better technology. It's a little bit like innovation is, is, is an innovation in the economy is like instant coffee. Just add a little bit of coffee into water and voila, you have changed. Just add some new technology and you have changed society. That is not the way innovation works if you look at history. Now, just to give you one example, humans have always invented new things. And frank, frankly, lack of ideas. I think we have a great number of ideas around today and I would like to see much more of them come through. 
Matt Ridley, the author and member of the House of Lords in Britain, pointed out in his, in his Hayek lecture last year at the think tank IEA, he said that many big innovations through history are made up of people that independently and separately come up with similar innovations, more or less at the same time. And so was it, with, in his example, with the light bulb that 23 people came up with, more or less at the same time and independently from each other. 23 people that all can lay claim for the patent that was, was granted to and, and uh, credited to only one person. They produced, published, and patented issues around the light bulb. Now, why this is, we can discuss another time, but the point is that too much of this discussion around innovation today concerns how to make these 23 people into 24 or 25. And I think it's much more important to ask how we can make this new technology be diffused in the economy. Because if a new technology is invented and not used in society, it creates no economic value, no perennial gale of creative destruction, and certainly no betterments. So we have to measure up capitalism to measure how it welcomes new innovations. And I'm in a minute going to come to a few examples, but it doesn't really look that we are welcoming new innovations like we hope for it to do. Western, really, if I'm pushing this really hard, I would say that Western capitalism appears more dull and detached from the spirit of creative destruction than in a very, very long time. This that used to be a space for rough individuals has become a place for hierarchies and bureaucracy where the hunt for predictability and to control the future is dominating ideas. And I'm, just, I'm going to give you a few examples before I run out of time. First, let's look inside of companies. Now, corporate leaders usually praise their appetite for innovation and disruption, but they are increasingly protecting themselves against change. And they practice a slow and managed development that easily allows them to control the future and control change. They avoid uncertainty, and they try to fit everything they do today into quantifiable risk metrics. They practice business and business development and strategy development today with Excel sheets. And not everything about the future can be pushed into an Excel sheet. And certainly we cannot predict the future, so this doesn't really add up. Entrepreneurship is out and bureaucratization is in in the corporate world. Owners favors corporate managers that can plan and organize and in a structured way build business. Only look at bureaucratization. It has been increasing dramatically in Western companies over the last 50 years. The consultancy firm BCG concludes that it has been on the rise with 7%. Bureaucratization has been on the rise with 7% for each year of the last 50 years in Western economies, in Western big firms. Short-term financial results are be become more important than building businesses long run. Playing politics. Successes wor at work has become a contest equally as much of business acumen as political wit. We all know this. We all see how politics is permitting big companies and what it do to companies. Now, you can go even further and say that Western companies are actually playing defense and has been doing so for a long time. Hoarding cash and, and buying out competition with mergers and acquisitions, of course, that could be an offensive and, and this is an active move to increase your stake in the market to make change, but many times it's not. Dividend and share buybacks has repeatedly been hitting record highs. Business investments and R&D investment is going in the opposite direction. The business sector went from borrowing money from investment to lending out money, making companies act and look like banks long before the financial crisis 10 years ago. Now, another example is 
The average growth of real gross domestic output per capita in the Western world began its downward trajectory in the 1950s. This, this is another way of looking at growth and growth development. And I know things have been improving over lately, and we can just hope it's going to be sustained. But Western capitalism is not producing economic value like it used to. And there has been many reasons behind this development, and we discuss more than just the ownership aspect of it in, in the book that was mentioned. But grey capitalism has been taking Western economies for a ride towards a growth strategy. One of the reasons is this. Western economists have been gradually losing their ability to grow productivity. That is, by adding smarter combinations of labor, capital, and technology. In Sweden, we almost have no productivity development whatsoever. But it, we're not having much of discussions about it. But it's, it's a huge problem in the Western economies. We're not doing things smarter and smarter like we used to. Another example, firm entry and exit rates. When firms get older, they tend to change in a slower pace. Change still happens, of course, but older companies tend to stick to, new, to old technology for as long as they can. It's only natural, and I would do the same. But in a dynamic economy, new companies enter and exit in a higher rate. So to all that say that we're living in the most innovative of times, how could you ever explain that companies are not going bust and new technology coming in, competing and, and pushing them out. And firm and ex enter and exit rates began to fall already in the 1970s. Some argue that, well, that's because big firms have improved the way that they're changing. They're changing internally instead. So we see change with people changing jobs within firms. So we Check that, of course, too, and we see that job creation and job destruction has been following basically the same path. People work longer with the same work. That is the, the, the blunt message I have. Job creation and job destruction is not increasing like we would like it to do in a changing and dynamic economy. So, To end this, Einstein once concluded that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And capitalism is really going, and for a long time has gone in the wrong direction, in the opposite direction. With this great experiment of ownership, it's becoming ever more complex and difficult for new innovations to make it big. There are a tremendous amount of interesting new things out there that doesn't really get a chance in this economy. And we're focusing a lot of attention to discuss all of the new great things that we invent. And that's good, it's fine. But we need to discuss more why the economy is not welcoming in new innovations. There was a discussion before about renewable energy. I started to work with that sector 15, 20 years ago. And much of the technology that we see is happening today was already there 10 to 15 years ago. Why hasn't the economy welcomed new renewable energy earlier? Now, not every institutional owner and asset manager is a bad capitalist. I'm not saying that, not at all. And they're not all the same. And some are truly acting in the spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism. And most, and this is the paradox, most established institutions, they are just like AMF with HD, Harley Davidson. They are professionals, and they're quite good at what they're doing. And that is, that's the paradox, because if professional ownership was less successful as a structure and a system, perhaps this problem of innovation diffusion wouldn't be as great. But Western economies need owners of companies that allow for entrepreneurial eccentricity. We need capitalist owners that rebel against behaviors that are making capitalism lose its mojo. We need owners, to quote from John Stuart Mill, that does not bend the knee to custom, but that rebel from time to time, and allow uncertainty, let loose curiosity, and embrace creative destruction. And with that, I think that capitalism can regain its mojo. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Björn Weigel. And I was feeling so positive uh, <laughs> after free. Maria Stremmes um, speak. Uh, now here you come and tear us all down again. Um, no, that was, that was really interesting. And obviously for, for a lot of uh, people in this uh, room, we, we have something to learn from that, I guess. Um, if we look back in history, at what time, at what point in history do you feel we had the optimal uh, combination of, of uh, capitalism and entrepreneurship? I think it has been a successful decline, and, and of course there are always different business sectors that are much more advanced in this and others still today. Uh, but I think that we somehow, perhaps in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 60s perhaps even, started to be much more careful and protecting, protected in what we do than just to welcome new stuff and, and new ideas. I think so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult. I get this question many times, and it's, it's very difficult to say that was the year when everything happened and everything changed. It's also with the push that we have today with new technology, you can only hope for things will improve. Uh, and, and certainly new technology and new innovations help. But we need to understand that the economic system is putting up roadblocks for change instead of embracing change. So when we listen to this splendid information about new nanotechnology, it's great news. Uh, what I see is that I fear that there's going to be a lot of obstacles on the way before these great new things really happen. And, and by the time we push this progress forward instead of embracing progress and, and trying to do more of what we have today, because there, there hasn't been a time in history where we had more ideas or innovations waiting to happen, I think. So basically you're impatient. I'm, I'm very impatient, <laughs> yes. I was, I, was, I was brought up at a time when we thought that we would have colonies on Mars. We were looking at Blixt Gordon flying uh, in, in, in poor black and white movies, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I was living in the Nordics and in Sweden when we, in 1989, suddenly opened up everything after having almost a, uh, a very strongly socialized society where we suddenly opened up and, and got a lot of new in innovations. And, and um, the, the market economy hit us uh, in a good way and created so much wealth, and I see that we have to somehow try to get back to, to, to that. You call it the grey uh, capitalism. Uh, and you mentioned lawyers and compliance and bureaucracy and, and uh, these roadblocks. Um, how can we revive creativity and entrepreneurship uh, in companies? In, your in companies. Mm -hmm. I think more need to go bust. I think it's very difficult to change corporate culture. I think it's much easier to try to bring in new companies. History tells that. Um, I, 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 I many times listen to people saying that, especially Germans, saying that, whoa, we need, to, we need to change, we need to embrace digitization and all of that, but we cannot destroy what we already have. And I say, why not? We need to, we, we, we need to, I don't know why we're so afraid of change, because everything in history tells us that change is good for us. In the long run, we became, become wealthier, we, we live longer, uh, so... Um, more change, embrace more change, I would say. That, that's, that's a key message. <laughs> um, you are in a room uh, with lots of, of investors and, and money people, um, and you say that they're mostly interested in keeping status quo. What would your advice to these people be? Well, of course, everyone in this room is not like that. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I, I say that it, it's, it's very difficult for one person to change, but I think that if you are... Uh, if you are an investor today uh, and you're, you're following all these rules and, gu rules and guidelines, and you, of course you need to do that, but try to be a little, little, bit, little bit of a rebellion. Try to see what happens if you, if you enter into something that is completely uncertain. You, don't have, you can't put it into an Excel sheet and tell everything is going to be fine, but perhaps you can convince your, your investors that actually this is a good thing to do for, for the greater good, if not anything else. All right, so let's go crazy then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit more crazy than today. <laughs> okay. Um, just the last question for you. No, I have another one actually. Yeah. Um, we, I think we all need to be uh, uh, thinking about uh, making an effort to uh, converting the society to a bit more, in a more sustainable direction. Mm. Um, are you an optimist uh, that we're able to do the uh, necessary technological and, and all the other changes necessary uh, in order to move in that direction? 
Uh, yes and no. I would say yes in the sense that I know that there, is, there are great, very, very interesting new technologies and ideas out there. But I'm, I'm very pessimistic when I look at the economic system, and I know that everything has to pass through the economic system. There's no way around it. So uh, we need to have a more blunt discussion on how to remove the roadblocks what we, that we have created. And, and if we could do that, but I mean, there was a discussion before about American politics, everything being very non, not changing over the last two years or over the coming two years. I say the European political system looks at least as bad, or the European Union political system when it comes to actually embracing progressive change that would make it easier for new innovations to, 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 to go through. I mean, it's, we, I mean, we see movements today throughout Europe where people are objecting to, to you know, the, liberal world, the liberal world order as it is, but also to change. And, and uh, it, it's... Uh, um, it, predicting the future is, is difficult, someone mentioned, and, and that, is, that is true in many senses. I, I, yeah, I think it was the, the philosopher von Brick who said that I'm 51% convinced that humanity will survive and 49% convinced it will not. And he, he was asked, so why 51%? And he said, I like to be an optimist. <laughs> so I think I, I, I say I'm 51% optimist in that case. <laughs> Great. All right, so we uh, did have another question uh, for another uh, speaker, actually, but I think you might uh, have an opinion uh, of this. Um, what's the future of cyber currencies? Do you have any idea? Oh, the Bitcoin question. Mm. Um, I have no idea. I, I, I find it very uh, difficult to get my head around how you can have a currency running with no real value in, 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 in that back it up. Um, to me, it's... it's uh, it's too early to, to, to say, and I'm not an expert, so I should leave it to the experts to, to say, but I, I think there's many things when it comes to cyber issues and, and, and cyber threats that we haven't either discussed that much in, in, uh, in the Western world. We're, we're a being a little bit blind to the issue of, of cyber threats, and I think that cyber currencies are, are being sub subject. I think that crypto jacking, which is... Uh, is, is trying to create crypt, uh, Bitcoin on others' computers rose with around 8,000% last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we have issues to deal with if it's ever going to, to be something yeah. out of that. Yeah. It is creative, though. It is very creative. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yes, yeah. Give we'll give that. it that. Um, Financial creativity. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Bjorn Weigel. Thank you.